Live. Hello, and welcome to Badger Talks Live, which brings exciting happenings to the flagship campus to the people of Wisconsin and beyond. I am Max Unger from Sussex, Wisconsin. I'm a rising sophomore in the College of Letters and Science studying chemistry with a certificate in physics. Today, it is my pleasure to introduce Mike Randall. He will be focusing on plasmas, what they are, where they can be found, and what we can do with them. Mike Randall is the former senior outreach administrator and a volunteer for the University of Wisconsin. Wonders. He has over 10 years of experience as a researcher in aerospace, military, and industry, and over 20 years of formal and informal education, em emphasizing science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. Please welcome Mike Randall. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Mike Randall. Welcome to the physics of plasma. Um, I Just a little background, I am the former outreach coordinator for the Wonders of Physics program at UW-Madison. I'm continuing as a volunteer. So if any of you have ever seen the annual shows, the Wonders of Physics annual shows, maybe you've seen my face in it, um, probably in some sort of a costume. Um, so this, just to give a, set this up powerfully here, uh, this is my very first time doing one of these demonstrations live streaming. And of course, being the first time, I'm discovering I have no access to the Facebook feed, um, which is fine, but I, would, I miss the interaction. So, and we're gonna play with this. We're gonna have some fun today. So if any of you are here thinking this is a highly technical conversation about the physics of plasma, yeah, that's not what we're doing today. So just to be straight with us. Now, on the other hand, if you're a parent or you have your kids here, or just you wanna have some fun, you're in the right place. So today, what we're gonna be talking about is plasma, what it is, where you might find it in your life. And like I said, mostly we're here to have fun. Um, in all of my shows though, the intent is to give you power in the real world, okay? And it's through a very simple, consideration. Consider that you are already a physicist. Yeah, you, you, right? The one on the left? Yeah. So you're already a physicist. You've been practicing physics since the day you were born and you're really, really good at it too. So this impacts every part of your life. Now we're going to be talking about a very specific area of physics, but before we get too specific, we got to set some of the vocabulary up. Okay. So the first thing is what is physics? Now at this point, I'd be asking questions and I'm sorry I'm not getting your comments, but just to save time. So physics is the study of stuff. Let that sink in. Stuff, like this tabletop or this room or me or you. Of course, scientists have a different word for everything. Scientists don't call stuff stuff. Scientists call stuff matter, okay? On the count of three, I want you to all say it with me. One, two, three. I can't hear a word, but <laughs> it's matter. So physics is a study of matter or stuff. And it's also the study of how you move stuff around. What well, gives you the ability to move stuff around? It's a one word answer, starts with the letter E. Yep, energy. Energy is the ability to do anything. So physics is a study of matter and energy and how those two things interact, how they play with each other. This covers a lot of things. We could talk about the physics of movement like throwing a ball we could talk about the physics of sound the physics of light you can see heat you can feel electricity magnetism and then a whole bunch of other stuff concepts lumped into a category called modern physics but today we're going to talk about a very specific area of physics which is plasma um now to understand what plasma is we've got to talk about states of matter now many of you may already know your states of matter but let's go through it simply so first of all everything all the ordinary matter in the universe which includes everything you see in this image is made out of little tiny things called atoms okay it's simple we're all made of little things called atoms how those atoms are arranged is what determines state of matter so this tabletop all the atoms they're pretty tightly bound to each other they might be wiggling around a little bit but they're not changing position that would be a solid yeah now, the water in this bottle, it can take on the shape of the container. It doesn't fill the entire container up. That 
relationship of the atoms, that would be called a liquid. They can kind of slide around past each other. Now the air in this room, the atoms are moving relatively fast. They're moving around. They can fill up the entire room or whatever container we're putting them into. That state of matter is called a gas. So which one did we miss? Oh yeah, it's this one. Plasma. We'll, we'll be playing with this a little bit more later. Plasma is where you take any of the other ordinary states of matter, solid, liquid, or gas, and you dump a lot of energy into it. It could be heat energy, it could be high voltage electricity, it could be being zapped by laser light. You put a lot of energy into it and it will turn into this state of matter. The solid, liquid, or gas will turn into a plasma. To understand what a plasma is, you have to understand that atoms are made of even tinier things. So if you could look at an atom, you'd see a center part, very dense, called the nucleus. And in there, there are little particles called protons, and which have something called a positive charge. We'll talk more about that later. And then nearby are little, even tinier things called electrons, which have a negative charge. And they normally hang out with each other. But when you put a lot of energy in, you can actually rip some of those electrons loose. So now what you've got in a plasma is a bunch of these atoms that are missing electrons. Those are called ions. And then the electrons themselves. And they're just kind of zooming around in a mix. So that's a very basic definition of what a plasma is. Okay, so where do we find a plasma? Now let's start, be specific. Where on earth in nature would you find a plasma? Now this is where I would love to get comments. Some people might say a fire. That's pretty common. Well, Fire's not nearly hot enough. If you're gonna use heat energy to create a plasma, you need to have temperatures up around 100,000 degrees. That's, fire doesn't come anywhere close to that, not even the hottest fires. Uh, some people might say, in your blood. <laughs> Technically, you're right, but that's actually an entirely different kind of plasma. If the kind of plasma we're talking about, if that was in your bloodstream, that would be very bad for you, okay? so. We're not talking about blood plasma. We're talking about this state of matter. Well, it's got a lot of energy in it. I heard lightning. Lightning? Yes. Lightning is a form of plasma created by high voltage electricity coming from thunderclouds. Okay. That is definitely an example of plasma on planet Earth. And by the way, when I say planet Earth, I'm including Earth's atmosphere. So where else might you see a plasma? In nature on Earth. Well, Sometimes if you look up in the night sky, certain times of year, you'll see the auroras, okay? So an aurora is plasma. That's where you've got particles, high energy particles coming from the sun, sun coming in at the poles and running into the atmosphere and generating a plasma. It shows up these beautiful green sheets of light up in the sky. So the, where you find plasma in nature on earth is lightning, the auroras and lightning. That's it. Well, I like lightning, so I said it twice. So that's a good thing. That's a really good thing because did I mention that to make a plasma, you either have to use really intense heat energy or high voltage electricity. If we had a lot of plasma here on planet Earth, do you think we'd be having this conversation? Nah, <laughs> no, we wouldn't be here. So it's a very good thing for us. But now I'm gonna open it up a bit. Where, when you look up in the night sky, where do you see plasma? Well, the answer is, where don't you see plasma? 99% of what you see up in the night sky is plasma. It's the most common ordinary substance in the universe. Now, these days I have to be very specific about that. Science, there's a lot of discussion about something called dark matter, where, which actually makes up the bulk of the stuff in the universe. As uh, one little problem, we really don't know what it is yet. So I really, it's hard to have a conversation about something when you're really not clear what it is. So for the sake of this, we're gonna stick with ordinary matter. So 99% of the ordinary matter in the universe, when you look up in the night sky is plasma, including our sun. So there, you can look at it. Well, don't look at it in the daytime. Don't ever look at the sun, that's a bad idea. But the sun is a giant ball of plasma. All right, so where on earth do we find plasma? Oh, I'm sorry, where on earth made by people do we find plasma to be specific? Well, there's lots of places. One of them is this, like a fluorescent bulb, fluorescent light bulb. When you put electricity into this, it creates a plasma that gives off light and 
it's a very efficient way to light our homes. Of course, we're using LEDs these days, but it's it's still very much in use. Uh, this guy here, a plasma ball, we're going to play more with that a little later. We'll zoom the camera in so we can look at that. Um, plasma TVs, we don't use them so much anymore, but it wasn't that long ago that our flat screen TVs, a lot of them were used plasma to make the images. And there's some other examples too. Um, on campus, they do a lot of plasma physics research. That's part of why I'm talking about it. There's a, it's a very important topic in the world for a variety of reasons. In general, the two specific areas of plasma research are to understand how stars, and including our sun, how they work. I mean, we really can't go to the star to go check it out, but we can recreate stellar conditions in a laboratory. So there's some very important work going on at the university. Another area that's a little bit closer to home for you or I is clean energy. So there's a lot of research going on, including in the past, in, in the, the Madison symmetric torus um, is something that scientists have used to explore fusion energy. So if we can take certain gases like hydrogen and we can squeeze them together at very high temperatures and very high pressures, those hydrogen atoms will fuse and make helium and release a lot of energy that we can, that's very clean. So we can use that to power everything that we'd normally power with, say, fossil fuels or other things. Um, it's very difficult to do, but some of the cutting edge research on that is being done at the university and has been done and is continuing to be done at the university. Um, and I've got some toys here. Let's, let's explore those a little bit. Now I'm gonna be turning the lights off here in a bit. So, um, by the way, everyone say hi to my director, Tara. Well, they, she's waving at me, so I'll wave for her. So anyway, Tara, could you move the camera in a little bit closer here? We're gonna start with this guy here. While she's doing that, this is called a Jacob's Ladder. So you turn that. And look, a little bit more. Perfect, right there. This is called a Jacob's Ladder. If you ever watch any old 1930s Einstein movies, this was something that was used for special effects in that. And it uses plasma. We're gonna turn the rim lights out. All right. And there you go. Now you see that arc going up? That's an arc of electricity that's going from the bottom of the screen to the top. You can probably hear it really well too. <coughs> So the question is, so we've, I've got a high voltage power supply in there that's making this arc of electricity, and that electricity is ripping the electrons off of atoms and making the plasma. So the question is, why does it do what it's doing? It starts at the bottom and then goes up. Let's turn the lights back on for a second. So it's really kind of hard to see here, but these wires are not parallel. They're closer here at the bottom and they gradually get further and further apart toward the top. So here's the question. If you're gonna jump across a canyon, would you jump across at the narrowest part or the widest part? Yeah, jump across at the narrowest part because it's easiest. Well, electricity is the same way. It's looking for the easiest path. So when I first turn this on, the electricity sparks across the bottom. But now, do you think that plasma is hot? Oh, it's really hot. Really, it's hot enough to glow, right? What does hot air like to do? Yeah, it likes to go up, right? So what's happening is that the atoms in a hot gas or a hot plasma, the atoms are moving really fast, so they take up more room. So they're less dense than the cooler air nearby. So they rise up, okay? Now, as this thing rises, because the wires are getting further and further apart, that little spark starts to have to stretch. At some point, it's gonna break. Now what's gonna happen? Got to restart at the bottom, right? That's the easiest place, and that's why it keeps doing what it's doing. It starts at the bottom and keeps arcing over and over again. Jacob's ladder. See, that's not so hard. Okay, let's, long we're here, let's move over to this plasma toy, a very common one. Can we tilt the screen forward a little bit on this guy? There we go, that's perfect. This is called a plasma ball. I'm gonna turn the lights out again. Again, we have a high voltage power supply inside here that's making, by the way, this is a particular type of electricity. It's called high voltage, high frequency electricity, meaning alternating current. The electricity is not just all going in one direction. It's going back and forth very rapidly. 
And that's pretty cool because some of that energy can actually get outside the plasma ball and enough to light up this fluorescent tube here. That's pretty cool. So what I see is a ball with a red center and lots of streamers in it. And in fact, if I touch the ball, oh, now all the streamers want to come to my fingers. So even if I put it over here or over here, it seems to interact with that. So what's going on? Well, the glass in here keeps the electrons inside, keeps the gases inside. So they really can't go through the glass, but something does get through. Remember, I mentioned earlier about something called an electric charge. It's like a little force field around the ions, anything with any charged particles, whether it's ions or electrons. So the particles themselves can't get to the glass, but their electric, the, their force field, their electric charge can interact with things outside the glass, like my finger. So kind of like with the Jacobs ladder, electricity wants to go follow the easiest path. So when I touch this, I'm actually creating a situation where it makes the electricity easier to flow to wherever my hand is. By the way, I mentioned earlier that that, that plasma is really hot. I mean, do you think the plasma inside this ball is hot? Well, again, yeah, it's hot enough to glow, right? So if I put my hand on top, why am I not screaming in pain? Well, again, a couple of answers. Well, number one, glass doesn't conduct heat energy very well. That's part of the answer. Now, my hand is getting warm. If I leave it here long enough, it'll start getting a little uncomfortable, but I'm okay. So the glass itself isn't the only answer. By the way, it's very thin glass, so there's not a lot there. So why wasn't I screaming in pain? Do you think there's very much plasma inside this ball? No, not really. It's very little. Only, only where you see the streamers. So even though the plasma itself is very hot, there's so very little of it, there's not a lot of heat energy in total to get through to my hand. Now, if you happen to be lucky enough to have one of these, they're not very expensive. Um, if kids ask your parents' permission, <laughs> uh, they do require parental supervision. Did I mention made out of glass? Yeah. Anyway, but they're way fun. And if you, uh, if you go on the... Uh, the Wonders of Physics website, I think you can still find some information there on some fun experiments you can do with plasma balls. All right, let's turn the lights back on. All right. No. Hmm? Yeah, let's back the camera up just a little bit. We're going to be talking about something over here. Something I did not mention at the beginning of the show, I haven't really given my background yet. Um, I'm a former rocket scientist. You see this back up just a little bit more. I want to be able to get this in, so kind of tilt it that way too. Perfect. A little bit more. Back in. Don't you love this? This is we're figuring all this out. Anyway, I appreciate your patience. And you might want to tilt the the, the thing back, the top of the screen back, just a scotch. There, that's good. So um, my background, I used to be a rocket scientist. <laughs> no kidding. I love saying that. But uh, some years ago, um, I used to develop advanced sensor systems for the space shuttle main engines and other rocket engines. So I've actually seen space shuttle engines firing on a test stand from in front of the blockhouse, okay, from 700 feet away. Um, the roar is tremendous. I mean, they literally shake the ground. And if I wanted to talk with you, I'd have to cut my hands over your ears and scream at the top of my lungs to be heard over that. They're very impressive. 500,000 pounds of thrust from just one of those engines, okay? And these are pretty much the same engines that are being used in the space launch system that we're gonna be sending people to the moon in, okay? Pound for pound, the most powerful machines ever built by man. There's one little problem. They run out of gas pretty quick. You know, they'll empty an Olympic-sized swimming pool in about 30 seconds, okay? So when they, when they go into space, all the pushing they're going to do, they do in about seven and a half minutes. And after that, they're just dead weight. Okay, so why is that a big deal? I mean, it works. We want to send people to Mars. And if we used regular rockets to get people to Mars, it would take about 300 days to get there, minimum. Can you imagine being cooped up in a spaceship for like 10 months? Are we there yet? Are we there yet? P pretty, pretty ugly thought, isn't it? But what if we could use a different kind of rocket, a plasma rocket to get there? Well, you know, by the way, I just happen to have a plasma rocket with me. Can we zoom in a little bit more on this? OK. 
because you know I have to tilt it up here. So here's my plasma rocket. Okay, tilt the screen back just a skosh. Can you see it? There it is. Ooh. <laughs> yeah, I know what you're thinking. Whoop de do, right? Half a million pounds of thrust. Most powerful machines ever built by man, pound for pound, versus. I know, I know. But here's the thing about plasma rockets. So basically, what ha what's happening here, by the way, this machine that is sitting on the silver ball, this is called a Van de Graaff generator. It makes high voltage electricity, about a quarter million volts. Okay, that electricity is going through those wires and out to the little wires at the end of the rockets where that electricity is actually ionizing the air. It's creating a little plasma. That plasma shoots this way, the rocket goes this way. Newton's third law, also known as the law of rockets. I encourage you to look that one up. Anyway, that's how they work. So plasma rockets aren't really impressive at face value. For example, there's a rocket engine that NASA's already flown. It's already complete. It's called the Dawn Space Mission. I encourage you to look it up. Dawn Space Mission was the first mission ever flown that where the, the vehicle went to two different celestial bodies under its own power. And it was able to do that because of a plasma rocket or an ion rocket. It's another name for it. The engines in the Dawn Space Mission at full throttle would generate about the same amount of thrust as these two sheets of paper are putting on my hand, about the same amount of force. It would go from zero to 60 miles per hour in three days. It's pretty wimpy, but here's the beauty of it. They're incredibly fuel efficient. So those engines could be run for days, months, years. In fact, to use up their entire fuel supply at full throttle, they could run for five years straight out. And it adds up. It really adds up. You can get some impressive speeds. So now if we could scale that technology up to maybe where you'd get like 100 pounds of thrust out, you would cut that trip from Earth to Mars down to about 39 days. 39 days versus 300 days. Um, I vote for 39. That's much more desirable. How are we doing on time? We're actually going through this pretty well. I was actually so looking forward to taking questions and I'm, I'm, I'm unfortunately we've had a technology breakdown on that. So I'll see if I can try and recreate questions from what people have asked before. Um, some of the important areas, I'm, I started mentioning a little bit about plasma. There's a lot of research going on on fusion energy. Um, not just in, in, in the past, it's been done by governments and still is being done by governments on a large scale. Look up the ETER project, I-T-E-R. Um, that is a multi-billion dollar, decades long project going on, but there's a lot of private companies taking it on too. I encourage you to look that up. There's some very clever ways that people are looking at uh, generating it. One, the Madison Symmetric Taurus, the Taurus is shaped like a donut. They're using magnetic fields to contain this plasma. The plasma itself in these devices, like the Madison Symmetric Taurus, uh, could hit temperatures like 17 million degrees, very high temperatures. And you really need to have that to create fusion energy here on Earth. There's other ways to do it too. You can use a laser. There's, they have some very, very big lasers that can zap a little pellet of this fuel. It's a versions of um, hydrogen called they're isotopes. It's basically this uh, a hydrogen atom is normally one proton and one electron. It's the simplest atom. There's another particle, a neutral particle, doesn't have any electric field or electric charge to it called neutrons. So if you add in a neutron, that just becomes deuterium. And if you add two neutrons, it becomes tritium. So some combinations of that, usually tritium is easier to fuse. And the scientists are experimenting with different versions of that. Anyway, to get those to fuse takes these enormous temperatures and nothing that we have can survive that. You can't just put it in a bottle or a box. It would just vaporize at those temperatures. So the only way they can confine that plasma is to use magnetic fields. Now with lasers, 
you get around that because it zaps that pellet of fuel so fast that the fuel doesn't have time to get out of its own way. It's something called inertia. That would be Sir Isaac Newton's first law of motion. Look that one up. So you get the little, like, little explosions uh, from the, the fusion of those pellets. There's some other things going on too. Um, I see, actually, let's unplug my microphone for a second here. Is there any way to, to uh, get any questions from the audience at this point? Nick? Can you hear me? I can hear you. Can you see the chat from where you are? We can send them that way if we have any. No, well, let's do that. I'm not, we're kind of dancing, but let's have the computer right here. Maybe I'll just do that. Like, I'm all about technology, and yet I'm still learning to master this technology. So we're just going to set this right in front of here. All right, can you throw it up on your screen, Nick? Any way to do that? Sorry, what was the question? Can you put the questions up on your screen? Yeah, so if people have any questions, come on in. Uh, feel free to leave any questions in the comments, um, and we will send them on over to Mike. While we're doing that, I encourage you. I have a website. Um, since I've been cooped up at home, normally I'm not doing shows. Uh, I travel all over the country to do shows, but those have all been canceled. So I created a YouTube channel. Uh, if you go to the physics experience, you may have noticed the banner in my background. Uh, I'm no longer with the university, at least not beyond a, a volunteer capacity, but uh, I started my own company called The Physics Experience. Uh, if you go to YouTube and look that up, I've got a YouTube channel there where I've been creating videos in my basement. Uh, I also have a link on there to a show I did uh, when I was with the university. It was um, 2016 National Science Olympiad. I did the um, part of the opening ceremony. So if you go to that video, it starts at one hour, 37 minutes in. It was the deluxe version of the physics of plasma, where you get to see me running around in 30 pounds of chain mail and uh, with some even cooler toys and much bigger Jacob's Ladder. And the finale of that show is we have we built two five foot tall Tesla coils. Now, I have a Tesla coil here. I forgot to demonstrate this earlier. So a Tesla coil, very much like the plasma ball, makes high voltage, high frequency electricity. Well, it looks like this. Okay. So imagine a Tesla coil, two Tesla coils, five feet tall. That's where the um, metal suit came in. That's why I was wearing chain mail because I actually stood between them and put my hands out and I had foot, foot long arcs coming to my fingertips. You can see all this on the video. And the very coolest thing about these Tesla coils is they were musical Tesla coils. So I actually had to wear hearing protection because loud music is coming out of these. And I had 2,500 people in the room with me, okay? And it was loud enough for everybody. And uh, just, it's one of, my, one of my favorite moments and it got it all recorded. So I highly encourage you to go over and take a look at that. Um, all right, do we have any questions up? Lasers, very big lasers. <laughs> I have worked, when, in my rocket scientist days, I did get to work with a 5,000 watt laser. Now the lasers I'm talking about for fusion are much even bigger than that. But a 5,000 watt laser is pretty darn impressive. Um, it would basically, if you, we, they were, if you aim it at a plastic block, it would burn a hole that deep in it like that. Just, there would be, wouldn't even be any ash left, it would just be a hole. <laughs> it's really cool stuff. What's the next mainstream use of this that we might see with plasma? Um, fusion energy is very exciting, but it has been very exciting for as, pretty much as long as I've been alive, which has been a while. Uh, it's one of those technologies they say, you know, 40 years ago they were saying, yeah, in 40 years we'll have fusion energy. Well, that's come and gone. But we're getting much, much closer, and there's a lot more activity on it. Like I mentioned, there's a lot of even private companies taking it on. So, I believe we have fusion energy, clean, unlimited fusion energy. I mean, basically, the, the ingredients, the fuel for fusion energy is water. A tiny little bit of water can generate a huge amount of energy. So we have an, an essentially unlimited clean energy supply. And 
the next stage for space travel, I mentioned ion rockets. Well, those ion rockets still use electrical energy, uh, typically from solar panels to run those engines. But what if we had a rocket engine that could run on fusion power? It would actually generate its own energy from the fuel it carried. Far, far more interesting in terms of what might be possible for that. And there are people working on fusion engines, fusion rocket engines, and I encourage you to look that up. It's a really cool topic. Uh, they also use plasmas a lot in materials research. So there's a lot of new materials that can be made using plasma techniques. Uh, chemical vapor deposition is one of the things you can look up. Um, I'm not an expert on that, but there are people on campus who are. Um, it's a way of combining things that wouldn't normally, you couldn't normally mix together uh, to make whole new combinations of things. Um, all right, who's got another question for me? Thank you for doing this. You're welcome. It's my pleasure. I miss you guys. I love being out with people. And I love my wife, too. And I think she'd like to see me on the road a little bit more. <laughs> it's like, time for you to get out of the house. Did you got some yard work? I've been doing lots of gardening lately just to get out of the house. Um, I'm a librarian in northern Wisconsin. Um, by the way, uh, you're welcome, Ann. I'm a librarian in Northern Wisconsin and shared it to my library page. Would love to have you live or virtually sometime. Well, at some point, the pandemic will end and I will be back on the road and doing this either uh, on my own. Or I may actually get rehired by the university too. We're, we're waiting and seeing on, on that. I was actually in the process of that when all the hiring got shut down on campus <laughs> for the pandemic. So uh, we'll see. But yeah, please keep in touch with me. I, I love that. And I, my website, by the way, is uh, thephysicsexperience.com. There's ways to link with me there. Um, who's got another question for me? My daughter is working on a PhD in space plasma physics at Rice. Oh my gosh, why am I talking? You should have her talking. <laughs> Somebody's got a real some real expertise. But there, it just goes to show you, it's a thing. It's a real thing. And by the way, it's going to just get more and more exciting. So if any of you are interested in physics at all, there's a very good chance the type of physics you'll be working on will be plasma physics because there's that's where a lot of the really cool stuff is happening. All right, we have another question. Right now we don't have any more questions. So if anybody else has a question, feel free to drop them in the comments. We're taking your questions right now. Again, I do encourage you to go check out that video on my, um, well, all the videos. I, Like I said, I'm sitting in my basement. That's one way to occupy my time. Um, it's kind of weird though to do YouTube videos without an audience. I'm just so used to doing an audience and interacting with people. Um, so this is my first, I actually hope to do this more and maybe have to actually figure out the technology so I can interact with you more directly. So maybe have it be more like a Zoom call. But um, yeah, there's so, I cannot emphasize it enough. Learn how your world works. Get that you are a physicist, whether you believe it or not, but you really are. Our brains are hardwired for physics because we live in a physical world. Reality is physics. So if you're talking about this, studying physics, you are studying reality at a very deep level. And if you want to have any real power in the world, it's, it's in reality. If you're, if you're doing anything that makes a difference, you're doing it in reality, period. doesn't matter what topic you're on. Um, even if you're writing a science fiction book, you're still writing a physical book, right? So it's all about reality. So learn how your world works. It will give you real power. I'll give you an example. Um, in the Olympics, now you wouldn't think of Olympic athletes as being physicists, but trust me, Olympic athletes do their physics homework. Uh, for example, um, Michael Phelps, when he won all the gold medals, he was wearing a special suit that reduced his friction with the water. I get that's not plasma physics, but is an application of physics that improved his performance. Now, maybe only by a few thousands of a second, but in this day and age, that can be the difference between winning a gold medal and having people go, and who are you again? So that's just one example. It's physics is used all the time in sports, but it's not just about sports. What do you like to do? Really? Do you like music? I've done shows on the physics of music. Do you like cooking? I've done shows on the physics of cooking. Do you like dancing? I've done programs when we, we used to have these events on campus, the, um, these uh, urban um, 
was it festivals of urban movement? I, I don't remember. It was basically a giant breakdance competition where people from all over the world would come here to compete. I did shows at those events called the Physics of Breakdancing. There's a ton of physics in breakdancing. There's a ton of physics in everything you do. Bottom line is whether you decide to go on and become a rocket scientist or not, learn how your world works. It will give you power around what's important to you. And the very best part of that is if you're being more powerful doing something you love to do, doesn't that mean you're having more fun with your life? I really believe that. I have a ton of fun with my life, and I want everyone else to have that too. All right, Nick, do we have any other questions? Uh, I don't see any other questions. Um, Michael responded of what his daughter is studying, if you're interested in that. Ionospheric disturbances in the geomatic, in geomagnetic storms. So she studies, if, if I'm reading that right, that would be auroras, right? That's how I read that. If that's not right, I'd let me know. Um, but yeah, I mean, there's, there's some really exciting stuff going on there. And even just by studying, you can study anything and you might discover something that changes the whole world, even though it's not something you intended to. Um, there were guys uh, who were studying uh, transmitting data through microwaves, using microwave transmitters. And one guy had a chocolate bar in his pocket. And he realized that when he was working around these antennas, this chocolate bar melted. And that was the foundation for how microwave ovens work. <laughs> Go figure, you know? By the way, there's some really fun experiments you can do. You can actually use a microwave oven to measure the speed of light. Um, and maybe I'll get an opportunity to demonstrate that in another show, but, um, or maybe I'll do that. Actually watch my YouTube channel. I will absolutely do that one on there. Um, uh, we've got another question. Are the Hall effects thrusters a type of ion thruster I used in the Starlink satellites a form of plasma engine? Oh my gosh, somebody's working on the Starlink satellites. That's really cool. Yes, that would be considered a plasma rocket or plasma engine. So anything that's, that's generating thrust by creating ions and then using electricity to accelerate those ions. Um, My, my director was uh, passing me a note. But yeah, anything that, uh, that's actually how, um, to be more specific, how plasma rocket or an ion rocket or an ion thruster, we're all talking about the same thing. What makes them so efficient is how quickly, how fast those ions leave the back end. In a regular rocket engine, all you get all your energy from burning chemicals, okay? So you can create a lot of energy that way, but it, it limits your top speed. And I actually have it down here. I believe it was about 10,000, yeah, so on the space shuttle main engines, the gases leave the back end of the engine at about 10,000 miles an hour, which is very impressive. But that does tend to limit your top speed. In an ion thruster, um, you could get exhaust velocities up to 200,000 miles per hour. Okay, you can kind of see where that would make a difference in how fast you could go ultimately. It might take you a while because the, the amount of gas coming out is not very much, but it's coming out really fast. So it means there's no really, it's a much higher upper limit to your acceleration. So I just encourage you to learn more about it. It's like, well, if you don't, if you learn something from me today, that's great. What I want you to do is get how exciting your world is and go out and explore it. I encourage you to do that. Can every element, can every element change into a state of plasma? Absolutely. Like without question, it's all a function of just how much energy you dump into it. That's all it takes. So if you take any element on the periodic table and zap it, whether you hit it with a high voltage electricity or a laser, you could turn it into a plasma for sure. Good question. I never had that question before. All right, do we have any other questions? That is all the questions we have right now. So the, the comment from my director, also my wife, uh, Tara, <laughs> um, was I was promising superpowers, which isn't exactly about plasma. Um, do we have, well, we're at right actually right at 1240. I tell you what, we'll do that another time. That's one of my favorite things to do. And um, again, watch, take a look at the YouTube channel. I will post some videos that'll show you how you can use physics to create superpowers, like genuine superpowers. Maybe again, kind of like the ion thruster, maybe not super impressive, but uh, you know, shooting particle beams off your fingertips, that's a superpower, isn't it? Um, that I'll show you how that can be done. All right, if there's no other questions, I am delighted you were here to hang out with me today. Like I said, I, I miss people. 
And I'm very sorry. Ne next time that I get the opportunity to do something like this, I'll make sure that we have a two-way interchange because uh, or have that set up more properly. So uh, I really would love to meet you. Uh, you can reach out to me anytime uh, via my website. I would love to hear from you too. Uh, thank you very, very much and uh, have a wonderful day.